a pleasure to be here and see so many friends, all your, your good faces. So, I'm neither a geologist nor a botanist, so this is why I chose this topic. <laughs> so, as you can see, the wildflowers take all sorts of different uh, climates, uh, different geological aspects, uh, from the palm trees in the desert to the wet of the savannah in North Carolina. Now, Hugh, is your microphone on? Thank you, Chris. Yes. <coughs> there. Took a long to think of you. That'll take a moment or two to see <laughs> Let's start with the Porter sunflower, because this is what we use as the, as the teaser. The Porter sunflower grows in only one place in Wake County. Now, why is that? Well, it's a, it's a silly little story. As you can see, it's growing on the granite here, or right next to the granite. It was introduced here accidentally. Some botanists back in the, the early 1970s brought in granite flat rock flora, the uh, Diamorphus smallii, the elf orpin, and some other things, and laid out sods that seemed it would take at Mitchell Mill. And it did. But there were seeds of the Porter sunflower in there as well, <laughs> to their surprise, and it has spread. So we will get on to talk about that in a little while. <coughs> We're going to talk then about these three communities, the Granite Flat Rock, the Piedmont Oak Hickory, and the Beach Forest communities. All right, a few definitions. We've got to have definitions, surely. So we can summarize and say that geoecology is the study of the interaction between organisms and earth materials. Some more definitions. There are plants that like calcium and plants that don't like calcium. I don't like these definitions, I prefer this definition. But then I'm a chemist. <laughs> You're probably all very aware of the difference between plants that like the acid soils that we have here and plants that like the basic soils in the limestone areas. Well, obviously, we don't have limestone areas around here in Wake County, so I won't do much talking about the chemical side of geology. But then there's this side of geology, the shape of the land and what it does for the native plants. But I want to start with this one for a very personal reason. The rain shadow effect. And we can see that at Asheville. Asheville has a lower rainfall and more sunny days than most other parts <coughs> of North Carolina. Because it is surrounded by mountains that capture the rain shadow. But my example, of course, we're going to go to Africa. <laughs> and specifically to South Africa, I grew up in the province of Natal. It used to be Natal and Zululand, and now it's got Zulu Natal. And do you see here a little patch of green, dark green? That's where we're going to go. <coughs> View from Google, from the satellite. And you can see how abrupt the changes from the, the dark green of the trees to the more arid beyond more detailed view of it. The edge of the green represents the ridge line. This is the mist belt of Natal. And so the ridges then are all along there. And this part is in the rain shadow. And look how dry and arid it is. Go on to another view of it. 
this is a farm that my parents owned in the 1950s. 350 acres here where we grew pine trees and wattle trees, which is a, a acacia melissima. The, the ridge line here is about 5,000 feet. The ocean breezes bring the moist air from the Indian Ocean in the east to this point. This area gets mist and rainfall. It's only 30 inches a year, but that's considered high rainfall in South Africa. And then on the other side of that, we get this, where the rainfall is 10 to 15 inches per year. Now, on the down slopes of the mountain, it looks like this, where it still gets a little bit of moisture. No, let's take it. I have to talk about Dr. Wells because my association with the B.W. Wells Association. So Dr. Wells was professor of botany at NC State, 1950 uh, to 19, oops, I've got it wrong. <coughs> 1920s to the 1950s. And he, one of his legacies is this book which summarized for the layman all the work that he did on plant communities in North Carolina. You and I might say that the regions of North Carolina are the Piedmont, the mountains, and the coastal plain, but he defined 10 regions, two sets of mountains, the regular mountains and the very high mountains. He didn't have a whole lot to say about the Piedmont. <laughs> but his real joy was the coastal plain. Now, as you can see, in this, what, look at this, seaside, marshes, swamp, aquatic, bogs, bogs, and finally, sand hills. Does it occur to you that it's water that really is the determinant? So, I'm going to talk about water. It switched gears. This shot of the Mojave Desert. This part is behind the San Gabriel Mountains in Southern California. It's close to Palm Springs. It's near Joshua Tree. So, rain shadow again. But can you see in there a little patch of green? Mm -hmm. <coughs> How does that happen? Well, the common explanation is there's a crack in the rocks and water seeps out. <laughs> Which doesn't mean anything to anybody. So let's talk about it. But first, a few more definitions. Hydric plants are ones that really have to have lots of water. Mesic plants require moderate amounts. Xeric take very uh, dry conditions. In this example, the rain falls on this mesic forest at the top, and uh, the water drains through the permeable soil until it hits an impermeable bed of rock and collects there, dams up there. And this is called a perched water table. Now, most of us would visualize that the water table would be horizontal, but it isn't. It follows the shape of the hillside above it. And at some point, the water seeps out <coughs> at the edge of the permeable rock, and the hydric plants grow at the seepage points. So there in the background, we have the, the mesic forest. Uh, you can see the hydric plants growing right along the edge, and of course, a, a pool with uh, cattails. <laughs> To me, the word savanna, as it's used in North Carolina, is completely wrong. I think of savanna like the African savanna with grasslands and a few dotted thorn trees around. But this was the meaning of the North Carolina term of savanna. savanna. 
Now, Dr. Wells' real introduction to the wildflowers of North Carolina began at the old savannah near Virgo in Pender County. This is one of Dr. Wells' original slides. So let's talk about this. This is Pender County. Here's Virgo down below. This is Highway 40 from Raleigh down to Wilmington. And this straight line here represents the old railroad. Dr. Wells had been at a meeting in Wilmington and traveled back to Raleigh the next morning by train. And he was absolutely astonished when the train traveled through this area and there was a huge wildflower area in full bloom. And he approached the conductor of the train and said, what is this place? And the conductor said, oh, that's the old savannah. He got back to Raleigh, consulted some other faculty members, and they reassured him there really was an old savannah, and really was a wildflower haven. He promptly put together a, a group to go and visit the old savannah. This is what he saw from the train. a photo of it. And this is the way he saw it later in the 1950s. Now, Dr. Wells was so impressed with the old Savannah that he went uh, all around the state talking to garden clubs about it, talking to whatever civic groups he could, and urging that it be preserved and made into a park. Well, Unfortunately, the state representatives from Pender County and from that area said, ah, nobody's ever going to develop that. It's just swampland. Nobody's ever going to be able to develop that. Well, here is Dr. Wells looking at the remnants in the 1950s. He's looking at this a little more. This area is what was the old savannah. It is now a beautiful farm. No trace of a swamp. A little side story here. 20 years ago, I was going to take a trip to Columbus, Ohio, and spend a week there. So I was looking to see what one could visit in Columbus, Ohio. And to my astonishment, I found that at Ohio State University, there is a hall of fame it is the drainage hall of fame. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrating the accomplishments of people who drained the swamps and brought about good health to the people living in swampy areas, eliminating the mosquito populations and so on. And I don't know whether any of you have much connection with England, but in, in the, 19, the 1830s, London was a terrible mess. The stench, uh, because the lack of sewers, was awful. And finally, Parliament got to do something about it and set in, in motion a big drainage plan for London, which made a huge <coughs> difference. So anyway, uh, Dr. Wells had talked to the owners of the farm, and they had agreed that they would sell this for a park and so on. But the lack of action by the uh, State House, the plans went awry. Uh, the son of the family inherited the farm, and he finally sold out to someone else. A man from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> who promptly drained the swamp and ruined the savannah plants. Harry LeBlond, 50 years later, was surveying areas and came to the site under the power lines, and he said, there are lots of these savannah plants now growing here. This is about 10 miles from the old savannah site. And this was one of the areas he found there. And that was very similar to the old savannah. So he has named this the B.W. Wells savannah. See some of the typical plants. <coughs> Here's a good list of it from uh, Alan Wheatley. 
<clears throat> so, what are the modern people doing about this classification of plant communities? Well, Michael and Alan published their thing, and look, they've gone a little further, and they're talking about different systems, <clears throat> getting beyond communities now. But again, you see, marine, estuarine, palestrine, and finally a terrestrial system. So water, 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 and then not so much water. <laughs> and they go in and take those 10 regions that Dr. Wells had defined and they give more detail on them. And more. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, let's talk about Wake County. So we're going to visit three communities. And we will start with these. There are four plant communities at Mitchell Mill. The Granite Flat Rock, the alluvial area, a small mesic forest of oak and hickory, and of course the river system. So here is an aerial view of it. If you're not familiar with where it is, this is Highway 96 running from Youngsville to Zebulon. This is the northern end of Mitchell Mill Road where it ends at 96. This is Pulleytown Road. And here is the little river running through across the Granite Rocks down to the mill pond here. Uh, the Mitchells lived in uh, this, this property here, became quite prosperous. The more recent generations living in a little house here. Let's go on. So the first place one stops usually is, but when you don't know your way around, you stop at the mill pond. There's the dam wall. <coughs> and you can see the, the granite. And the mill pond is quite beautiful. I'm amazed at the engineering of this myself. All right, let's look a little more closely at the granite. And in summertime, it looks like this. <coughs> the, the significant thing is that this area represents a little hollow where mulch has accumulated. And the botanists tell me that the really significant thing is that the uh, cedar trees grow in there and drop their leaves occasionally, which then forms a mulch that collect in these little hollows that are called solution pools by the geologists. And if you look closely, you'll see sedums and mosses and so on. You know, when you first look at it, it's not all that, that interesting, it's just green stuff. <laughs> the red leaf stuff is elf organ. Uh, we've got a wonderful selection of mosses and lichens. So the elf orpin is, is the red, the sandwood is the white flower, you get a little yellow dandelions. Saxton fringe blooms a little earlier in the season, it blooms in uh, March. Wonderful varieties of mosses, and of course the red cedar being the significant tree. The early botanists all said the cedar must be able to break into the rock have its roots go into the rock. And other people said, no, no, no. It depends on silt and water flow at the surface. And there are a couple of instances at Mitchell Mill where one could see cedar trees that have blown over. And let me tell you, their, their roots do not penetrate the rock. <laughs> their roots form circles, 
great big flat wheels just sit on top of the rock. <laughs> so they did, do depend on, on the wash of minerals and water. So the elf orphan in that shot is not in bloom yet. The sandwood is. We get wonderful varieties. Here the rock crest is in blue. That's Highway 96 running along the top there. This area though is, uh, has become open to vehicles and ATVs and Jeeps are going in there and parking on the rock. Uh, Washing their cars. <laughs> they go and wash the vehicles. Yeah, they, they're bouldering these days. <laughs> So you can see that the plants are growing in very thin soil right on the margins. There's really not much depth of soil. The saxifrage, of course you, you probably know how saxifrage got its name. It's that old myth again. Saxi comes from the Latin saxum meaning a stone. Frag of course means fragment or fragile. So you translate that it means stone breaker. The, sax, the, the belief was that the saxifrage penetrated the rock and broke the rock apart. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Wonderful selection of reindeer moss out there. And of course, this is Mitchell Mill uh, with that perched water table. Water coming from higher up the hill and across 96. And here you can see along the fringe the hydro plants are in bloom in April. And this is a wonderful example of a little solution pool, which is so typical of, of, for the Grand Flat Rock Forum. And Quaker ladies growing there. Just fascinated by the patterns of the masses and lichens. More mosses, sphagnum type mosses here. And then Quaker ladies are persisting and coming up through the mosses. Even a spirea is trying to grow there. And so in the background you can see the mesic forest of hickory and oak. And the water sunflower growing again in the very thin margins, <coughs> the thin soil right next to the, the flat rock. So this is September. The quarter sunflower is flourishing. All sorts of things that we get here. That's the sandwood with the Crigia dandelion in the, in the background. There is some debate as to which species of sandwood this is, whether it's the uniflora, as you can see there, or the glabra. But it is a very fragile community, as you can see. And then, the other thread is the Chinese privet that birds bring in. And it flourishes there, and is quite an invading army. And the park biologists are trying to cope with the privet, trying to eliminate it. It's a real struggle and battle. Uh, this area is administered by Falls Lake State Recreation Area. And the headquarters for Falls Lake State Recreation Area are 20 miles away, where Highway 50 crosses Falls Lake. So it's very hard to get a, a ranger out here. Very hard for rangers to patrol this area. And they cannot fence the area because there isn't enough soil to put a fence post in. It's rock. <laughs> uh, and to further exacerbate it, Falls Lake area normally has 10 rangers. Right now they're down to five rangers. It's a real disaster. All right, granite is primarily um, a mix of, of three 
rock types. Feldspar, which is the calcium aluminum silicate, the quartz, and lots of mica. Here you can see the, the black specks are, are mica, the white background is the quartz silica, and the pink in this case is the feldspar. Well, I've, I've got to just give a little attention to these two other systems. That, uh, the alluvial, I don't go in there much because it's populated by poison ivy. <laughs> but you can see that the trees are growing much taller here uh, in the alluvium. Liriodendrum are growing very big and tall. And then there are the aquatic plants, and again, I don't go into the river, so I don't pay much <coughs> attention to those. But there's Lavigia and uh, Hanamania and uh, mm. Some other floaty things, bulrushes and <laughs> All right. Let, now the Piedmont oak, hickory forest, you, you'll know and recognize all the trees there. <coughs> of course, it's indicative that the soils are deeper. It's a wonderful place for, to see the Carolina yucca. And this sh shot shows the transition zone between the the two, the granite flat rock flora and the yucca starting to come in. The fringe tree does very well there, in the shade of the other bigger trees. Carolina jasmine and cross vine flourish. Solomon seal, kind of surprised to find it there. And lots of oxalis and viburnum. Prairie sink for it. That's a surprise. <laughs> Poison ivy is not a surprise. <laughs> and spurge, it's gone wild, probably from some old residence. Now, B.W. Wells Park, in case you don't know, it, is located in the Stony Hill district of Wake Forest. It is part of the, the North Carolina Park system. The park superintendent would like it to be a group camp only, and not a day camp. But this is the view I love. The complexity of the, of the Noose River in this area. So down here, oops, at the bottom, is the intersection of Highway 98, Six Forks, and this is now New Light. This is Ghostland Road coming here. This is Shinleaf Park. This is Holly Point Campground. This, uh, I've, got, I've got to mention this part of Shinleaf. This is known as Turkey Neck. <laughs> and this is the bend of the Noose River. The old times referred to it as the bent of the Noose. And so this is Bent Road. And this was the Wells homestead here. This part here is the group camp at the, the park. From this shot, you can see the pine trees showing green. Hardwood areas are leafless at this point. And we will look at this area here. There's a soapstone outcrop here, so I call this soapstone cone. The famous Eagle's Rock is here. Um, this is the typical plant community, a, a beach forest ecosystem. you're familiar with these trees, the beech, the red oak, the tulip poplar, the red maple.
American beaches, it's typical buttress roots. Uh, the parasitic beach drops that grow on the roots of the beech tree. It's a lovely little bloom. The understory trees, really lovely examples out there, especially of the hop hornbeam and the ironwood. I love the hop hornbeam for, which is named for the way its blossoms look like, the blossoms of the hop vine. And those cling on and turn into the seed pods all the way into the fall. And the hop hornbeam has the characteristic cat scratch bark, which contrasts with its American hornbeam that has muscles. <laughs> Again, you're probably familiar with all these. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty typical of our, our area, unlike Mitchell Hill. But back to this view, we're going to look then at this area here. Starting here with this white circle, this is where there is mountain laurel. This is an area where there is uh, a good selection of spring ephemerals. And they're there because of water. There is good seepage from this hillside down through here that really encourages those. This is a bit drier area up on the hilltop. And then here, there is a gully, a drainage gully. And of course, that's populated by Christmas ferns. Then this area is quite strange. There's the outcrop of, of soapstone. And this is west facing a much drier site, so we get quite different plants growing there. We love the fiddleheads. And then this is one of my favorites giant chickweed. As a gardener, of course, I detest chickweed. But this giant chickweed is charming. Very big blossoms. And I've never seen it in anybody's garden, but it, it grows beautifully here. It does not appear to be very invasive. Trout lily, an often misidentified thing. Yes? On that map where you showed those different areas, did uh, HB, H? B -W. B -W. How is it BWL? It's always a fine HDL. Did he map those out, or have you just explored those and identified those different? Oh, th thank you for asking that. Uh, uh, Dr. Wells bought this property in 1950 when he was on the point of retirement. Before that, <coughs> he and his wife used to bring their students out to picnic there. So let me, let me go back to that. Is that the one we should, we should look at? No, let's look at this one. Uh, this is Eagle's Rock. And this area here was a wonderful wildflower area before the lake was impounded. The plants grew all along the river bank. And it was a very narrow river. I should have included a, a picture from that time era showing how narrow the, the, the opening was between the trees on either side. Um, I suppose I should tell you the story of how, how Dr. Wells acquired this property. He and his wife had gone to Durham to buy a new washing machine. And they were having a lunch and reading the, the newspaper. And Maud looked at classifieds and said, oh, Bert, you need to look at this handed him the paper, a farm for sale. And it was obviously this property. And Bert looked at Maud and said, Maud, we have to do that. We have to get that. Can you give me that $100 back? <laughs> and he used it to make a down payment on the property. 
and in later years he said this was the best move he'd ever made. It was just a wonderful new life for their retirement years. Now, Dr. Wells passed away in 1978. He knew the dam was coming, but it had not been impounded yet. It would probably have broken his heart. He did live to age 92, and Maud continued living there in, until 1999. Dr. Wills did something that all the other people who were affected by this did not do. He sold the land to a syndicate of attorneys and executed a living trust so that he and his wife could continue living on the property for the rest of their natural life. The other people did not do that, and they were immediately displaced when the Corps of Engineers bought their property. They were moved off the land. But Bert and Maud stayed on here, or Maud stayed here, for many years. Uh, yeah, I, I have friends who farmed across the river from there and said, the government stole our land. They did uh, take them to court. That was uh, my friend Rufus Forrest and his brother Linwood Forrest and uh, Aaron Fussell, but they lost the case of court. Uh, what year did Paul's, what year was the dam done? Bobby, do you remember what year they, they finally built the dam? It's 81 or 82. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wasn't here in this area. Mm -hmm. Do you know how long it took to build? Very fast. Because we lived on Bent Road in Stony Hill. And we were amazed at how fast it was. It never did get as deep as it was supposed to. No. In fact, they had they cut off Six Forks Road, the original, because they said it would be underwater. But they miscalculated when they did their surveys, and so the bridge would not have been underwater. So they blew it up for no reason. But we did have a nice bridge party the night before. Bailey's <laughs> 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 Road is underwater, though. Parts of it, yes. Now, is mm -hmm. this an area people can get to now? Yes. Like, yeah. how do you get to it? What, what Take, is, get onto Highway 98, depending on where you start from. This is just a few miles outside Wake Forest on the west side of Wake Forest. Stony Hill Road comes off 98. Go to Stony Hill Church, and you'll see a prominent uh, house sign or house number of 7500. <laughs> Turn left there at Stony Hill Church. And the second road after that to the left is Bent Road. And you'll park at that gate, perhaps walk in or come on the second Saturday of April when we have Heritage Day. And the park is open, we give tours <coughs> around the BW Wells homestead. Admission is free. We have wildflower walks, geology walks, uh, tours of the buildings. We have activities for children. We do. We show them how Dr. Wells would build a baseball from scratch. Uh, how to build kites. How to fly kites. Uh, second how to Sunday in April. Second Saturday in April. Saturday. April the eighth. And he also we, he also taught people to paint pine needles. <laughs> do pointless paintings. Um, yes. Helps to join the B.W. Wells Society. Oh, thank you for saying that. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So the trout lily. Um, this one, you'll notice, has yellow <coughs> anthers. That is typical of the Americanum species. But what grows out at B.W. Wells in, in most areas in this district is this one, the umbilicatum, that has purple pollen. all know and love hepatica. And here are the liver-shaped leaves. And wild ginger with its, you have to dig to find its blossom under the leaves. This was taken on a rainy day, so it was really glistening.
have, there's the grape fern, there's putty root, and there's Christmas fern. Looks better in the next fern. And this is the grape fern at maturity. That's its uh, fruiting leaf coming up there. Its spore is going to be very easy to identify this one. And it does have blooms, and as you can see, the deer will eat the, the blossoms. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite plants because it's so strange. Partridge berry blooms in pairs. See a pair of buds here, two blossoms here, two blossoms there, four blossoms there, two here. To produce fruit, both blossoms have to pollinate. And then each blossom will produce a little berry. And then those two berries merge. <laughs> I don't know what the advantage is of that. <laughs> All right, this is looking across to, to Soapstone Cove, looking to the, the dry area. And uh, this is a view across the lake with <coughs> the Soapstone outcrop here, and over here is a, an outcrop of Serpentinite. Both are uh, ocean floor rocks. <coughs> so what are ocean floor rocks doing up here at surface level? Close view of it. Soapstone was very popular. It does not fracture when heated. It is excellent for making fireplaces. Unlike granite, which just explodes when heated. And this was quarry, and uh, beside it, oh, let's see. All right. it's a mafic rock. So it's high magnesium and <coughs> iron. Uh, does not have much calcium in it. But as you know, our plants are all habituated to calcium. Almost all of them have to that. <coughs> so in California, there are great big areas that are called serpentine barrens. Serpentine being the ocean floor rock, it's high magnesium, low calcium, <coughs> and very little will grow on it with serpentine rocks. Now, there are a few that succeed here. See this one here? That's Vaccinium. Uh, the reason that the ocean floor rocks here is because this interesting geological phenomenon that happened a million years ago. Sorry, a billion years ago. Gotta get my scales right here. Where an ocean plate was approaching from one side and a continental plate from the other. The ocean plate went down under the continental plate. The water that was contained in here got heated. When it gets down to 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, it gets extremely hot. Because of the pressure, the water cannot boil, so it becomes superheated. Temperatures reach 400, 500, 600 degrees. Did you know that hot water is a good solvent? <laughs> you, you wash dishes. Superheated water is an excellent solvent. It will dissolve iron, it will dissolve gold, it will dissolve silver. So what happens is the hot water starts coming up here, dissolving the rock. You get these little pockets of magma, but finally you get a big pocket of magma. And then eventually it finds its way through either. Uh, dissolves a path through here, finds a crack, and suddenly there's a burst of steam and there's a volcano. <coughs> there are two old volcanoes in Wake County. Stony Hill and Adams Mount. Adams, Adams Mount is on Bailey. Adams Mount, what are you Got interesting rocks out there too. <laughs> Now, that all looks very smooth, especially when they show this on TV and show it all in motion. It looks very nice and smooth. 
but it isn't. And uh, the geologists call this area the Falls Lake Melange. <laughs> this slide is a melange. <laughs> The point of this is to show the oceanic crust gets trapped, quite often gets trapped. And so that remains on the surface, it doesn't all get pulled down here. Oh, and you see the formal name for it, an accretionary prism. <laughs> so here we have uh, soapstone, here we have serpentinite covered by a layer of what had been molten mica at some point. And of course, here is red clay. <laughs> Covering all. All right, here, here is a plant that does grow on this, and that's the same plant. Now, the question is is that plant growing there because of the magnesium, or is it growing there because that's typical red clay of our area? And I think it's the latter. But, to go on, one of my other favorite plants grows along the path. Now, why is it growing there? Is it, the, is it the rock or is it because it's got a west-facing slope and is dry? Here are some of the other rocks. This is the serpentinite. Those old times were fascinated by snakes, weren't they? <coughs> this, this looked like the spotted skin of a snake. And guess what this one is? Rattlesnake Master. <coughs> but that's my favorite. And Chris, how many how many uh, hypoxus plants do we have growing in the gardens here? I don't know. Different species. I can check up online real fast. <laughs> The ocean floor rocks are typical of the magnesium rocks. They have a much higher specific gravity or density than the granite does. Granite has a specific gravity of about three. These have a specific gravity of about five or more. St. Andrew's Cross also grows in that area. Okay, back to this visit some of these other points. So that was, this area here was that dry area. Now here we have Ziegel's Rock. Let's go and visit that. Quite different type of rock. Fortunately, I was out there in 2006 when the water level was very low in Paul's so Lake. I, I love this slip line here where the bulk has shifted. Here you can see the roof of what used to be a cave under there. You know, when I first came to Wake Forest, I met the old timers. They used to tell me about how when they were Boy Scouts, they would come down here and camp. And some of them would jump from the rock into the water. And I asked the boys who jumped, and had jumped, how far it was to the water. They said, 70 feet. Down into the river. It doesn't look like the river's deep enough to catch a falling body at 70 feet. I asked some other men, he said, no, I wouldn't jump. I said, well, how deep was it? He said, it was 50 feet to the water. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the rock. Look at the layers. You see the layers there? That indicates that they're, that they're created from sediments, not from volcanic action. You can see more clearly from the other side, the the layers of sediments there. But it has been tilted upward by uh, movement, geological movements. Now, this is made from sediments, river sediments. You can see the gravels in there. It is dated to 460 million years ago. Uh, isotope aging. Analysis. And they tell us that this matches 
rocks and river sediments in Morocco. So this, this formed by the action when the North American continent collided with the African continent 400 million years ago. That compressed it. It's called metasedimentary. Sedimentary rock that is metamorphosed by heat and pressure. Of course, 200 million years ago, that great big continent that was called Pangaea broke apart again to form North America and Africa once more. All right. We've talked about all those. And then we get to the mystery of the mountain laurel at BW Wells. Mountain laurel is here, here, here. It's growing on these bluffs, bluffs of the ocean floor rocks. So this is serpentinite and soapstone and chlor uh, chlorite schist. And why does it grow there? It's up above the water. Of course, I guess it was growing there before Falls Lake too, so it was growing high. And I started trying to study this and said, does it like magnesium? And I took soil samples and had them analyzed and I guess I didn't dig deep enough. It didn't show high magnesium. Uh, they're growing in the red clay, but how far do the roots go? Do they reach the magnesium rocks or not? I don't know. But the botanists tell me the reason the mountain laurel here thrive here is because they get the cool air that move up from the river. And if you go out to uh, uh, the Crabtree area, you, you'll see mountain laurel growing on the, the bluffs there. Again, the cool air coming up from a creek up the slope. So we, we find three completely different uh, ecosystems when we look at Mitchell Mill and B.W. Wells. The granite beam, the calcium aluminum silicate, appeals uh, to plants like the red cedar, whereas at, at B.W. Wells, it's a magnesium silicate, and you don't see any eastern red cedar growing in these places. For some reason, we get the hypoxis in the mountain laurel growth. Finally, a view of the tip of Shin Leaf and the bent of the Noose River. Oh, Good wow. oh, <laughs> Any more questions? What were the two volcanoes, and where are they? The old volcano. Stony Hill. Adams Mount. Adams Mount is in Bay Leaf. And Stony Hill is just up the hill from here. Yes. You, you drive through the township of Stony Hill and you go down the hill, 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 down the hill. <laughs> miles of it. Now, I'm sure that uh, Gina here can probably tell us a little more about the unusual soil type in that area between B.W. Wells and bay leaf. It is a very distinct soil type, different from the red clay of North Raleigh and so on. Is that the two to one, the Mount Marillonite? I don't know. Uh, it, it's <coughs> higher magnesium. The, the band of uh, ocean floor rocks stretches from here on the Noose River all along New Light Road down through Six Forks Road to Blue Jay Park and Barton's Creek. You can find the soapstone there on that. Does it edge. stop there or does it go any further south than Puget Point? It 
I think it gets buried at bay leaf under the red clay that the. Because I live right near bay leaf. That's why I'm curious. Um, I live just east of bay leaf. So that's why I was curious. I haven't explored that area closely. You'll know if you see it. <laughs> yeah, but the Barton's Creek area, that, that great big open area across from the, uh, the boat launch, yeah. very prominent uh, mm -hmm. soapstone there. So I live, uh, we have one of those outcrops on our property. So I'm just curious about how, um, how much it's eroding and affecting the chemistry of that hillside as it comes down to a draw, because we do find really well, they're not really unusual things, but we find things that we don't find elsewhere in, in the woods. Um, you know, putty, the putty root that we find is on that slope um, just down the hill from the, from, from the outcrop. I just didn't know whether that was affecting. Yeah, isn't, isn't that a puzzle? Yeah. Uh, so my, my prime thing is it's water that's the terminant of these right. wildflower communities. I can find the, the putty root along the Wake Forest Reservoir, which is a granite area, mm. but very damp in the woods there. Very hard to find, though, when it's in bloom, because the deer eat it off. <laughs> yes, Gina? Um, you mentioned the event on April 8th, but do you do tours in the, in the woods? Um, because I know I've been on one with you, and it was amazing. Do you have any yes, we, by reservation. <laughs> <laughs> we have to, to uh, file an events request with the uh, Falls Lake office and so on. But we can do it. They, they like the, the request to call with the Falls Lake office to request. And then we volunteers do it. Does the April 8th event have a website? Yes, it does. WWW dot BW Wells is one word dot ORG for organization. Yes. Yeah. What is the name though? What is the B in the W name? Bertram Whittier. Okay. Bertram <laughs> Whittier Wells. Uh, now, Dr. Wells' first wife. Uh, was a teacher at Borden High School. She was a science teacher. And she took the students from her class to the little creek across from the front wall of Borden High School on Peace Street and turned that into a nature park. Filled it with native plants. And it's known to this day as Oh my goodness, the name's just gone. Yeah. 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 Thank you. What is it? What is it? Edna Metz Wells Park. She died young, unfortunately. <coughs> and then Dr. Wells married Maud, who had an interesting history of her own. She was the first woman ever hired by the Raleigh Police Force. <laughs> you had something there? Just want to say, just one taxa hypothesis. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's from your home country. Get <laughs> to three spots. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. So, is the um, Mitchell Mill Park is that open to the public? All yes, the time? it is. Don't go on the weekend. <laughs> Don't go on the weekend. She yeah. says. Mm -hmm. Oh, I went there one Saturday morning, the first Saturday of, of school vacation. <laughs> And somebody, a group had had a party out there the night before, or tried to have a party, and they built a bonfire on the granite. And when I got there, there were sleeping bags, blankets, air mattresses, cokes, and they even left their beer because they fled in terror when the bonfire caused the granite to explode. <laughs> It created new solution hollow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know much about the, um, I mean, how does the chemistry of the diabase compare to? The diabase is uh, richer in iron. Okay, right. 
Now the diabase <coughs> runs through Butner and it's mined in Butner by uh, Sunrock Company. And it produces all these strange plants like the, uh, the variant in the uh, coneflower. Coneflower, thank you. <laughs> Veragata. Levigator. thank you. Uh, Picture Creek is a wonderful example. And a friend of mine is a, a warden at an area of the Buckner Glen, which has got uh, some of these other strange plants too. But yeah, it seems to be the iron. More metals in it. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.